What's up guys? It's Friday. Let's talk about parts on two Jay-Z's. A lot of you guys have commented on the previous video and maybe on other videos that you want to know more about the oiling system. What I figured out works good for a drift car. It doesn't have to be just a drift car. Like how I set up my oiling system on my race motors and on customers motors. So let's get into detail on that a little bit. And then also I'm going to share with you a couple other things along the lines of what I figured out racing with a 2JZ motor, um, things that work a little bit better that I've, you know, like did trial and error where I had lots of failures, not motor failures, but part failures that would then lead to developing of a part that does not fail that's currently on my race car that has years and years of now um, without failure. So first let's start with oil pumps. So we were here with Edgar's motor a couple days ago and I was explaining how the oil came out this way and it, I blocked off this one part and such and such and you guys, some of you knew exactly what I was talking about but probably most of you got lost and you're like, explain more. So what I'm going to do is start with a stock oil pump. Fun fact is I save every oil pump off of every motor I've ever built and I don't reuse oil pumps. This one says New Jersey FD in remainder of 2017. That's your fun fact. So stock oil pump right here from Toyota. You guys want to know the part number? Here you are. Same number. That is for a GTE, not a GE. The way you'll know is GEs do not have a crank sensor. Otherwise they look very similar. GTE has a spot for your crank sensor. I'm going to take this apart with you guys. What I do is I start with a stock oil pump. It will not have front main seal. It'll look like that. No front main seal. But otherwise it'll look just like this. It'll have a plug in here. This one doesn't have the plug because I remove it because I do the other oil system that I explained to you. But what you got to do is flip it over and you're going to take this rear cover off and that's going to expose the gearing for the pump and what makes the pressure but we're going to have to take some stuff apart and you're going to have to have the proper tools to port it and you're not going to have to port it a lot but let me show you the tools these are the tools that you can use for porting carbide bits the aluminum one right here um, this is a steel one but you'd use a pointed aluminum one a rounded aluminum one to get inside here you're gonna have to undo these screws which from factory have a tad bit of Loctite on it and they don't just come apart and they will want to strip easily. What you need is a gear wrench impact driver. What the impact driver does is lets you hit it with a hammer and it does a little like eighth churn each time you hit it with a hammer and it's set up for loosening or tightening. So I'm gonna use the larger it's a P3 head on this Phillips. Make sure it's not set up for loosening or tightening, which would be this way. So you press down, click it over, set up for loosening. Then you hit it. Okay. So I'm putting tension on it and I'm hitting it and then it loosens. Here we go, I'm gonna get all of these off. We ran into some issues. This guy worked perfectly on most of them. There was three that it just, they were too tight because I had red Loctite at it. Because once you've opened this, you don't want it to reopen while your motor's running. And I just was being cautious and I put red Loctite in there. In the future, I think I started putting blue Loctite. Maybe that was like, this season, I think, last season I might have, but, um, so th the problem there was that couldn't get it out, so what I did is I ground it down to a flathead, and then, I haven't done these two, I was going to show you how I was doing it, uh, I still maybe could use the flathead on this impact driver, but we're not going to do that because it might mess up the tip on the impact driver, so what I'm going to do now I will show you. Usually most of these are opened up so I pretty much reached into my box of oil pumps and grabbed the one that hasn't been opened. 
but whatever. And the reason I saved the oil pumps is so I can open them and see, like, the damage. My God, that was tight. The damage that's done or whatnot, you know? To the, I'll show you the back of the gear and the back of this housing. Okay, so let's take all these out now. It'd be really cool if everything went super smooth and it just came apart effortlessly, but cars are never that simple. We all know this. Okay, so let's take this rear cover off. Okay, so this is why we save the oil pumps and kind of check up so you can see like see how it's there's that groove there where it's starting to eat away into this rear cover it's not horrible but it is eating away a little bit so there's metal transfer happening here and here um, I don't know if you guys can see it as good as me but that's not horrible after a half season on a race motor, stroker motor. You probably could reuse this pump. I wouldn't on my race motor, but you could. So when there's oil in here, it's very nice and sealed. Gets you freely this moves. It's not the easiest to get these out. I just flip it upside down and let it fall out. Might not happen that easy this time. Okay. Got that out. This one is shimmed and I didn't port it. I just opened up this hole, possibly that hole. There is the opportunity to make too much oil pressure and you don't really want that. So what I do is I open this up like that and then any rough edges that are in here, I clean it. But you gotta be careful not to hit this machine surface area so i'm going to use a screwdriver and show you you can clean up these areas here a little bit i did not do that on this one um, and you can clean up this area a little bit if there's rough edges this is just a casting so some of them will look even different than this one on the inside i always upsize this hole by one size of a drill bit and i upsize this hole by one size of the drill bit and then I take this out which I'm gonna do for you guys and I shim it if your tolerances were already like perfectly to spec with OEM and you do all this and you let the oil come out the side here you will have too much oil pressure if you you have a tight built motor not one that needs to warm up before it stops you know clanking and clacking around one that's like um, piston to wall clearance is correct and tight and also the oil clearances on your main bearings and your rod bearings are correct for either what the OEM manufacturer requests like Toyota or like if you have CP pistons what they're asking or uh, Carrillo rods what they're asking then you might want to think twice about how much you port this because you'll go overboard and if you're using an NA block without oil squirters and it doesn't need to send the oil through all that, then it's um, gonna have more oil pressure. So all these things you need to factor in. You also need to think about how thick of oil you're gonna use. Because originally the 2J wasn't supposed to use 2050 or 1060, which some people think they need to use. It's, it's asking for like 1030 or 1040. I know that there's gonna be a lot of heat in the motor, and I know that I'm gonna be in a hot area when I'm racing. So I still run 2050. I put my tolerances 
within spec to what they're asking for. CP Carrillo, BC Crank, and then I port this. Just so I just go in here and if there's like a super rough edge or an extra piece that's like needs to be removed to um, help open the flow up, I do that. I don't know why this one wasn't done. I think I shim, I know I shim each one, but for some reason I didn't port this one as much, but I usually port right here and right there for sure to open that part up um, on its way out and because it, it's coming in and then going out right here. So it's pulling right here, so you want it to have good flow, and then as it goes past, you want it to flow good on its way out as it builds pressure. So this is the relief here to drain back. So if you open that too much, it'll kind of screw you, so don't do that. You just do the one size over. And this is just from what I was taught from older people that have been doing this years before we were doing this because 2 j is an old motor. These guys were doing this a long time ago. So then take a look down here. That's where the oil could come out, but Toyota doesn't do that. They have a port right here blocking that with pipe thread and they tell the oil to go out this way and then turn a 90 and leave there. And that 90 runs right here on the block. And then it does another basically 90 or just shy of a 90 goes in here and then another 90 into your oil filter and well into your oem cooler and then up into your filter this is what it would look like oem so it has a lot to do before it like makes it to the motor so first it goes through your filter filters it then back into the motor um it has a lot of like tight passageways to go on that have 90 degree turns and it slows it down and each thing just makes more restrictions. This is what I would suggest if you're trying to get more flow or higher oil pressure it'll do both but then at the same time it'll do too much if you're running too high of a weight of oil so and you're not let's say you're in a colder climate and the oil never gets thinned out and I don't know you would hopefully warm your car up I would hope so anyways, it would leave here. So then it eliminates one of the 90s, just comes straight out of here. And then it would be flowing tubing like your A in lines that go over to your filter relocation, which probably is somewhere along your frame rail right here or somewhere that you can get to. It all depends. We're gonna walk over to TJ Hunt's car and I'll show you how we did that. And then we'll walk back over here and keep talking about the different oil pumps and the options. Joe's still working on TJ's car, but let's look at it real quick for a couple minutes. So if you look in there, his oil is leaving from the oil pump like I just talked about. Hard to see. That AMI right here. Hitting with the top of the flashlight. That's leaving the oil pump and it's going straight out of the oil pump into this Earl's filter relocation. So it's going to the in and then it goes out of the oil, the oil filter. Re First it flows through the filter, then it goes out of there into his oil cooler, which is right here on his car. And then it heads all the way back and it goes into the block where the filter used to be. Okay, so you get that. Let's go back over there. That was a good visual, but uh, so you can understand. So it leaves here, goes through the filter relocation, and through the filter, through the cooler, which you need a cooler, so please set up a cooler if you're gonna race your, your motor or you're gonna drift it, whatever. Go through that and then back in. So as it enters here, that's when it goes through the motor. So it's going through the motor and then come back through the oil pan up the pickup tube and back in this hole and does it all over again. So that is a quick rundown of how the oil system is on my pro car, how it is on some of our customers that allowed us to do that. Um, not all the customers want to do that, but lots of them want the ported oil pump and there's a couple manufacturers out there that sell a ported oil pump 
and I'll talk about that right now. The one that I use on my car was either done by myself or to save time and because the sponsor was willing to send me one of their pre-built ones that's exactly the way I would have done it, then I ran Drift Motions. So see this one says DM modified. So Drift Motion modified this. One thing I did forget to tell you. Okay, see this port here? Drift Motion will tap that and put a plug in it for you. Or if you don't want to do that and you just want a, like a higher flow, a higher pressure pump and you just want to run it through the stock system, they leave the port there. See that, that Allen head um, plug? So that port is always in the stock oil pump and there's no threads in that. Drift Motion modified this in many ways and one was tapping that. So if you did want to run the OEM fuel uh, oil setup and just run it like this, but create more volume, more pressure, you just buy this pump from Drift Motion. There's companies out there, competitors of Drift Motion that also sell them. Or if you have just have the money for the oil pump, but you don't want to, I don't know, pay Drift Motion for their price. They're, this is super reasonable. He sells this for $339. This is $225 usually if you bought it from Toyota or like someone that's selling a Toyota pump. So a hundred more dollars, I don't know, like that's, I would rather just do that because it'll take more than an hour for sure. So you, I would think it's gonna take you two hours to modify one of these, especially if you've never done it, it might take you longer than that and then clean it and then you're very nervous putting it back together if you haven't done it. So take that into consideration. Check out that one at Drift Motion or do it yourself. Let me finish taking off that really quick though. So you can see the spring and the 60,000 spacing I put in there. The only thing is there's so much um, that goes into play with these motors and how it could one guy's oil pressure could be much higher than the other guy's because he set up his lines better or all the above. Okay, so this will just shoot out at you if you're not careful, so be ready for this to be very sprung and come out at you. So this is stock how they have it with this spring and another spring on the inside of that spring. Inside there is your piston, which is right behind that hole. I was telling you guys I drill out one side, so that's your piston. You gotta get it to slide out. Yeah, the spring that goes on top, the piston sits like this, and this is how it is inside of the pump. That slides in there. It has the amount of tension that Toyota set up originally. If you'd like it to be a little bit more tension, you either put this washer on top here, put it back together like that, or when there's oil, it'll stick in there. So this washer, just an ordinary washer, but it's 60 thousandths thick, give or take. This goes in the bottom like that or the top. Either way it will work. You're just creating a little bit more tension. So this will create more pressure. The volume is created by letting it leave with less restriction. Leave out here and create the flow to be a little bit better. So lots of guys are now doing no oil squirters. That will create more pressure in itself. So possibly, you don't need the spring, you just you just need to port this so it's a little more free flowing and then let the oil come out um, of, instead of turning 90, 90, 90, just come straight out, go through your filter, your relocation, your cooler, and back. I use dash 10 lines or dash 12 lines, depending. So. One other thing, when it comes out of here, it's dash 10. When it goes back in here, the block is dash eight thread pitch. So what you have to do is you gotta get a steel ORB to steel dash eight ORB to dash 10. And then you have to drill out your steel so that it's the same ID as a 10. People are putting dash 12 lines on this, but in reality, if you're you're breaking it down to go through here and here at a dash 10 size because you can't drill this out to a dash 12 there just isn't enough meat on here if you were to do an 8 uh, like on the back side at least if you were to, to do an 8 to a 12 
it will never increase. You can increase it to the size of a 10, but not to a 12. So I've just gone with a 10 and it works fine. Some guys do 12, but then they're still restricting it as it goes out and it goes back in. My theory is that if it's restricted twice already to a 10, I'm just gonna run 10 lines. So my system goes all in 10. We've been doing it in 10. I, I have a lot of oil pressure even at idle and I run oil squirters. You don't want it to go much higher than 110 at full throttle. You could see 120 is okay, but if you're at like 150 at full throttle, because you ported this as hard as you, like high as you could, and like you put an extra um, washer underneath here because you thought, oh, I'll add more, don't do that. Because you're just gonna create too much, and the flow might be great if you had more flow, but you don't want too much pressure. That's just not gonna be good because it still needs to drain back from the head and get back in and you'll just have problems. I don't know the answers because I haven't done all these problems. I never once have uh, chewed up a bearing on one of my race motors or any of my motors. I've just never done that because I'm very cautious on this oil system. I run a rear sump pan because it's a Supra and the motor needs a rear sump pan. So I've never had oil starvation problems. Some guys that run front sumps like this on S chassis since their forward acceleration is pushing the oil back that way and it doesn't fully get back in here to pick it up and recirculate it they run into some issues here and there occasionally and they'll cook a bearing that is why people are cooking bearings on like TJ Hunt's car did that and um, like other drivers like Ken Gucci or Forrest Wang that run front sumps they've been known to cook a couple bearings. If you have a Supra with a rear sump, it kind of solves that problem because as you accelerate forward and the oil gets pushed back, it's putting it back into the pan and it always has plenty of oil in here in the pickup tube or for the pickup tube to send it through the motor. On top of that, I always overfill my system by just about one quart. Toyota has designed all their motors and all their cranks to you could overfill it by one quart without it um, coming down and interfering with the crank. Like the crank won't interfere into the sump if you, even if you have an extra quart of oil in there. So keep that in mind. It's not bad to add up to one more quart. You'll still be okay. I do it always, always, always on my race car. It has a quart more than it's supposed to so that in those times that the oil is up and out of the way because of G-Force is pulling it, still have enough in the sump to send it back through the motor. So the fun part is always going to be putting that back in. You will literally struggle forever. So the way I do it is I jam a paper towel inside of 24 millimeter socket and then you can find a way to get pressure on there without it sliding up inside because you need it to allow you to push down the thread in and there's a decent amount of tension. The other way is to have a second person use a 24 millimeter ratcheting wrench and the other person's kind of pushing down on it while they ratchet it. If you guys have questions on the oiling system or why I don't use an Aki sump, it's because I don't have a front sump oil pan. If you had a front sump oil pan, you could do this oil mod and then use an Aki sump. Why don't I not use dry sump? Okay, I never had an issue with a bearing yet. Why spend all that more money? And I'm pretty mean to my car, pretty mean to the motor. I build it right, but I don't drive it nicely. I drive as hard as I can drive it, and I just never have an issue. One day, probably will get a dry sump as of now. Um, the only dry sump I had was on my Black Supra. It was not even for drifting, and I since sold that because I came out with a better dry sump kit, and I was like, oh, one day I'll get that, but I haven't needed it yet. That's my oil pump 101 for you guys. Thank you.